Phil Harris and Josh Vegan come together in an incredible fortnightly podcast, Dream Big, Move Fast. A progressive contemporary conversation on what it takes to be a dynamic thinker, leader and role model. Backed with over two decades of friendship, trials and tribulations, they teach from real world experience on what it takes to dream big, move fast. Life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body, but rather to skid in broadside in a cloud of smoke, thoroughly used up, totally worn out and loudly proclaiming, wow, what a ride. Hunter S. Thompson. Phil, this has been my favorite quote that I've closed Blueprint with over the last couple of years. Hunter S. Thompson's story is phenomenal, becoming that journalist and moving into becoming a bikey and what he did around all of that. But it kind of just gives me that energy and that enthusiasm to really want to run at life and just like literally just go out there and to do as much as I can and, and to get those experiences and those opportunities around people and literally just to be one of those people that literally just is like unbelievable because you're chasing so much cool stuff. What are your thoughts on this quote? Does it inspire you? How does it get you energized? Yeah, it's a, it's a great quote. I was about to say, I'm pretty sure it's one of your favorite quotes, but it seems as though societally now, Josh, it's we uh, in, in sporting teams and sporting individuals, it seems to be okay that you should do your best and strive for excellence and become the very best that you can be but as you and I've spoken about before there are so many people who are just so passive uh, passive about this thing called life you know I've decided I'm just going for more kind of balanced approach and you know whereas I feel like this quote is uh, by the way I, I do support a balanced life of having you know being good at all things but this quote is about just having a crack having to rip and going all in so if you're going to do if you're going to real estate be the best real estate agent you can possibly become if you're going to be a dad be a great dad if you're going to be a husband be a great husband all of those sort of things so jump in boots and all have a crack I love it well done good so, quote you know the funny thing is that I, I want to live life on the wild side you know and I'm, I'm not saying about you know uh, drugs alcohol addictions gambling I'm uh, the wild Wild side for me is that like we traveled the world, we saw some stuff, we, we gave it a go, we, like, we, we pushed it up against the wall, we did things that people said were impossible, we made it happen and that's the greatest thrill for me in actually making those things occur and I think that like if you don't risk it, you don't grow it and you know um, how many times you and I sent each other that little quote by you know Michael Jordan, you know I've taken 9,000 game winning yeah, shots yeah. and I've missed it and whatever and we used to do that every single time we lost an Australian auctioneering championship, right? But that, 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 it was too often. Yeah, but that, that whole conversation is that like, you know, you, you said to me, recently you go oh, you know the reason that I've um, that I've got to a level of success in my business is because I've been one of the biggest failures I know <laughs> and I was like yeah that's true but that basic idea is you tried more stuff how important is it to try stuff and to, to see if it works and then when you find out what works to double down and to really go deep on that and amplify it yeah, I think that um, that was a good lesson for me as well. Is just learning in, in relation to mis- well, you know, differences between mistakes and failures. You know, so you can uh, make it's not good to you know repeat mistakes. Okay, it's okay to fail for, but once you failed once, learn from it and don't do it again. Mm-hmm. Right. So, yeah, I agree. I've I've certainly made plenty of mistakes, but. Hopefully in the future, not as many, Josh. Yeah, yeah. You know, the interesting thing uh, there's that um, whole conversation. I think that like um, attitude is a skill you know, and how good are you at that attitude? You know, so touch wood, this doesn't happen to you, but, you know, downstairs right now, someone's just reversed into your car, right? And all of a sudden you go down to your car and you're like, oh, now you could seriously get upset about that. And, and you know people who get upset about that. Oh my goodness, someone reversed into my car and, you know, and then they don't get it fixed for a year. So every time they go to the car, like, oh, someone reversed into my car and they just live this life. Whereas like, you know, I've learned and whether or not it's right or wrong, but if that has happened, I go, wow. What a great opportunity. I've got insurance and I get to use it today. You know, and like, and people are like, are you, are you right? I'm like, yeah, I'm right. Because if I go to the smash repair guy, I might pick up a listing while I'm there. What a great opportunity to meet some people. And it's about, you know, I'm not saying that I'm ridiculously positive and optimistic about the world, but also too, I'm not going to spend an hour of my life in a negative zone when I don't need to be there because I, I tend to want to live life on the sunnier side. I realize that there'll be some dark stormy days, there'll be some clouds, but I want to try to see the sunshine in, in every opportunity that literally I'm gifted. And some of those will be some really tough lessons, but with some of those will be some really amazing lessons in life. Yeah, you definitely are an optimistic guy. I'm, I say that analogy you just gave, that was us actually two weekends ago. We were out with the kids and we came back from wherever we were and we come back and there was a big uh, bump in the back of my wife's car. And then f- thankfully there was a note on the uh, the windscreen that someone had left behind. I'm not quite as, I can't say I was celebrating Josh. So I think that, <laughs> 
but there's a listing <laughs> coming. But no, I don't sweat it. Ring insurance coming. That's why we pay insurance. Move it. Forget it. There's other things to worry about in life. Move on. So. I, I thought that Mrs. Harris was going to say, hey, Phil, you know how we had a baby? Yeah. Well, guess what? We had a car crash. <laughs> it's a great conversation. So let's talk a little bit about it because um, really um, life is about like, you know, perfecting the skills and, you know, getting into some areas of excellence and, and learning how to be really good at what you do. And, you know, I've had some adversity thrown at me over the years in training rooms. And um, one of the greatest adversities, I was in a training room in Melbourne a couple of um, weeks ago and there was a, a lightning storm and it took out all the power. So there's no projector, there's no lighting, we can't move up the blinds, the room is pitch black and I've got a room of 150 salespeople, what do I do? So what I do, okay, cool guys, no problems. Well, you know how there's dating in the dark? Guess what? There's now training in the dark. And I literally then got the whiteboard marker out, put the torch on on my iPhone, drew the diagrams that were appropriate. And I spoke to the entire audience for an hour and 15 minutes without any reference to any slides because um, I know my stuff when it comes to that particular presentation and what I was there to do. It was interesting because the oper- one of the operational people who runs the training in that organization turned around and she's like, wow, you did not skip a beat. And I'm like, well, I, I would hope that that would be the case. And it's what I'm thinking in my head, not aloud. Because after 15 years of doing it, like literally I've spent so much time to learn the skill and to learn what works and to know how to overcome adversity. And my piano teacher taught me when I was six years old, he said to me, Josh, I got to tell you, you got to stop this. I'm like, what's that? Because every single time I'd make a mistake, you know, like, da, 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 eh, you know, it's like, I would stop. And he says, stop doing that. He goes, when you make a mistake, keep playing. Because and then if, and you can recover quickly. People might not even notice it was a mistake. And in the modern day, you can just call that art. You know, and that's and that's the interesting conversation. So it's about learning that you know now more than ever before. Don't get shy. Go forward in the direction of your dreams and get to a period of, of excellence. Now, if I have a look at it, uh, we get the opportunity to train some of the most amazing people, and and that um, often involves the property managers or the investment managers or the asset managers, whatever you want to call them. But the property management section of our residential real estate industry. And one of the key things that I've kind of picked up and I've been to a few different property management conferences and I've kind of seen that. And what I've worked out is a lot of the theming tends to be around you know, some stuff that's going on in PM at the time. So maybe some legislation changes, which are important. Um, Usually there's a lot of stuff around conflict and I'm like, okay, you know, so con- you know, confronting conversations. I'm like, wow. And then recently there's kind of been a theme over the last five or eight years, and it's probably a societal theme as well. There's a lot of stuff about mental health. And, you know, I'm not a mental health practitioner. There are people that specialize in that. I'm not a doctor. I'm not specialist at that. But what I do know is, is that like, it's bizarre because the more you talk about it, the more seem, people seem to identify and have those issues. And so mm. what I worked out very quickly is that, hang on a second, there's a completely different side to property management that maybe a lot of people actually don't get. And we're also going to do some sales stuff. For us. So for our sales teams listening, don't tune out. This is a really important part. And what we worked out very quickly is, is that what are the basics and the core of what it takes to be a great property manager? So Phil, I'm going to give you a challenge that if we were going to go down to the local Bunnings and, and take a, maybe not a Karen, but take a, a Wendy and a Bob out of Bunnings and we were going to bring them into Harris Real Estate Property Management or any property management business across the country, what are the essential things that we would need to nail in terms of areas of excellence? And we're going to do the same for salespeople, you know, through this podcast today, um, that if they just got that nailed, would actually make them like, you know, have really good understanding of the core. So then they can be phenomenal in their delivery on the day to days. So we're going to work through a couple of those things. First key thing in, in PM basics, and it relates a lot to sales basics as well, is that we've got to have some understanding on some, some conversations. So first one is equity. Okay. So equity, what's the opposite of equity? It is Debt. Yeah, it's, equity it's, and debt. Sure. Yeah, great. Yeah. So, so ultimately I have a million dollars. I have $100,000 in a deposit. There's $900,000 in a home loan. That's better known as debt. The equity that I have is, is what's left over once the asset's sold. Yep. That, that literally, that sits there. Equity is a really important part. If I have a large amount of equity, I can often use that equity to then go and buy an additional property. That's called cross collateralization, where we actually can use equity in one property, go and buy another. So you actually don't have to sell a property to do that. Um, you can go and get a property revalued. Um, next one, can you talk to us a little about negative gearing? What is that? How does that work? Well, just in terms of negative gearing. So um, this is obviously um, when you purchase a property, um, there's borrowing costs against that. And then you've got the ability to claim some of those losses back under uh, under the current tax structure. Yeah. So AKA income coming in is 500 bucks a week. Your home loan is $700 a week to, to buy own that investment property. There's $200 extra that you need to put in the government allows you to actually um, claim that $200 and not have to pay the tax on that to put the it. The government in. allows at the moment, Josh, we yeah. should be clear. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay. Um, obviously, the opposite of positive gearing, 
And positive gearing is when what the income is greater. Income, yeah, surpasses the actual cost of the of the property. Okay, great. And then there's neutral gearing where it's the same. So like literally whatever I'm getting in is what it's costing me. And then in addition, there's something called depreciation. What's depreciation again? Yeah, so depreciation on, so as an example, some of the um, fixtures and fittings inside the property, you can depreciate those uh, over uh, a certain lifetime of the holding of the asset. Yeah, so the basic idea is that, you know, carpet, let's say it costs us 10 grand to put the carpet in this room and whatever the government allowance is, and they might say, okay, great, you can actually depreciate that asset over the course of the next five years. So $2,000 a year can come off my tax because I'm actually going to apparently be replacing that carpet in five years' time. And sometimes there's accelerated depreciation. So you often see in a lot of the budgets, there might be like an instant asset write-off. We can write off certain assets in a very short period of time. Um, then also inside of property, not a lot of people would talk about this, but capital expenditure. What's what's capital expenditure on a property? So CapEx is there might be uh, an upgrade that's required to do on the you know, throughout the course of the property. So it might be um, updating an air conditioner system throughout the property or some renovations that need to be done, you know, some improvements that need to be done to the property. So I didn't know it, but apparently orange bench tops aren't in. People love a marble bench top look and feel right now. So if I have a marble bench top inside of that property and I repaint it white internally so it looks a bit fresher, I might be able to get an extra $50 a week in terms of rent. So capital expenditure items are understanding that, we, you know, with your landlord, um, you know, do they actually want to spend some money, you know, from a taxation point of view? And also off the back of that, that then leads into the depreciation bit, right? Because if I've spent some money on improving the quality of the property, there are people that can come in called a quantity surveyor who will actually have a look at the property and say, hey, you know what, this is the depreciation schedule that you can now apply against your taxation over a period of time. And there's actually businesses that do that on behalf of that. And then the final one, and I know it's a simple one, but how do you actually work out the returns? So let's say, for example, that I've got $50,000 a year in rent, Phil. I have a property that's worth a million bucks. What's roughly the return that I'm getting on that asset right now? I'm going to roughly suggest around 5%. Exactly right. So what you do is you take the actual income, yeah. you divide it by the asset value, and then when you have a quick look at that, that actually equals the result, right? And it's a really interesting conversation because let's say, for example, I'm getting a 5% return, but my loan at the bank is a 6%. Now I'm actually in a position, you can see that property is negatively geared by at least 1%. Does that kind of make sense? And so if I'm in a position that I'm paying the bank, you know, 6%, but I'm getting a return on my asset at 7%, now I'm positively geared because I'm getting more income coming in. And also good for the guys to understand, maybe more so prone to the commercial markets of understanding how the value of assets um, vary from market to market based on the cost of capital. Yeah. So particularly in, you know, in commercial markets, if, you know, generally, you know, going back a while ago, if you're only borrowing your money at 2% uh, and there was a 5% return return, then valuations are based on um, cost of capital plus margin. Yeah. And this is a really important conversation because now that we've got the basics out of the way, let's go and have a look at what I go to call the moments that really matter. So the moments that matter to me, first of all, entries and exits. So um, Phil, I moved into a, into a property when I was leasing in, in uh, Balmain when I first moved to Sydney and you wouldn't believe it. It was a beautiful warehouse of Palmer's fine. And I went to go and adjust the Venetian blinds at Royal Timber and I adjusted them on day one of moving in and all of the Venetian blinds fell from seven meters into my hands. And I rang up the property manager. I'm like, I'm really sorry to tell you, I've just moved in, but all the Venetians fell down in my hands. And she's like, oh, that happens all the time. So this is interesting about like, you know, shouldn't you be really clear that when I move into a property, what are some of the challenges I'm going to go? When's bin night? What's the bus route? Or what's the accessibility? You know, tell me a little bit about that. But also too, at the point of exit, there's going to be some friction about the oven and how clean it is. So when I was in a position, I was moving out of a property in Bondi, you know, this is going back 15, 20 years ago, they're actually in a position They said, hey, Josh, um, by the way, we can organize an exit clean. So for $250, we'll have a cleaner come in, clean the fans, clean the oven and make sure the property's at its best. And it was just an awesome experience in getting those things done. If we get exits and entries right, it changes a lot of things. Next conversation, onboarding landlords. Okay, so if I'm onboarding a landlord, Phil, um, how do I communicate with you? Do you refer SMS, email, direct SMS, you know, direct um, WhatsApp, you know, whatever? And do you like a phone call? Um, if I can't get a hold of you, is Jen enabled to be able to make all those decisions around what needs to happen on that particular property? How does that work? Um, and then also that, what's your experience? So do you, do you only want to do uh, emergency maintenance or are you open to capital expenditure items? Do you need a depreciation schedule in play or not? Do you need us to get a quote for you in relation to your insurances? Uh, do you need us to make sure that we're actually getting the smoke detector and the compliance, and all of those things done for you and getting those checked on a regular and consistent basis? Um, how important is it to learn everything about the landlord? So then that way it's captured in a file 
So that way that anyone who's taking over that landlord or working on that property file can read through the preferences of how that customer wants to be served to make sure you deliver the same consumer experience. Well, I think it's critically important, but what I'm really hearing from you, Josh, is just really forward planning on what we know are going to be the friction points. So irrespective of whether you're dealing with the landlord or whether that be a tenant, there are certain things are going to come up that will be friction points. And if we're ahead of the game, we've actually nominated these to either the landlord or the tenant that here's where the issues are probably going to arise. And we've always forward planning when these moments in, in time actually do come up, then it's actually not so much of an issue because it's something that we've already discussed and forward planned for. So I think that, you know, proactive salespeople, proactive property managers, they're simply better communicators and articulators of the journey ahead. So Phil, I've had an investment property for 21 years. Uh, an interesting conversation. We had a guy called Bob who mowed all the lawns. That was fine. And, you know, um, inadvertently, you know, Bob passed away a few years ago and they've got another bloke doing the job and um, and this particular guy, I think his name is Jim, you might know him. And, and anyway, long story short, so Bob's gone, Jim's now doing the job and anyway, tenant moved out and so recently I painted the property and whatever and, and I got mum and dad to go and have a quick wander through and mum and dad are like, what's the story? I'm like, what's that? They go, the front lawns are beautifully manicured. The back lawns are two foot high. And I was like, well, Jim mows those. And dad's like, no, he doesn't. And I was like, oh, wow. So I went to my property manager. I go, does Jim know that he's got to mow the back lawns? Oh, no, no. I'm like, but, no, but Bob always did that. Bob mowed the front and the back lawns. But literally somewhere in Bob going and Jim coming on the job, whoever briefed Jim didn't tell Jim that he actually does the back lawns, but I've been paying more for Jim than what I paid for Bob. And so this is that whole idea is that like, I should never have to rebrief you every time that I change to a different property manager inside of your organization because there's a reallocation of the portfolios. And so what the argument is there is that what you're trying to do is to make sure that when there's landlord handover, which naturally happens, you reorganize a portfolio, that everyone who's taking over that portfolio doesn't have to ring up and ask Phil, how do you like to have your property managed? But actually has an understanding. Now there's a difference with the review where we understand where you are and have your preferences and needs changed, but actually the core basic should actually be the same in the way we go to deliver that. Now we're kind of moving into a little bit of the, the infrastructure and the system, the process as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, for effective property managers, it's one thing have a good memory, but like, have you got yourself organized so that all the appropriate documentation is in order? So heaven forbid you weren't there the next day that somebody can pick up that file and know exactly where we stand. Yeah. So arrears, it's an awkward moment when people are in trouble with money. Um, I like to be in a position, I'd be really human first. Hey, Phil, thought I'd give you a quick call. Seems a bit weird, but for some reason your rent hasn't made the account uh, transfer today. Um, can you just quickly check in with the bank, see where that's at, or is there anything I might need to know? Maybe you've changed bank accounts or changed jobs or pay cycles or something's actually happened, but what could we do to get that rectified? And so I'm really nice about that. Passive about it and friendly. Yeah, yeah friendly. And then we're going to move into, and if it's a serial offender, it's a very different story. We're actually going through whatever we're going to do inside of the legislation of what's allowed and those conversations before we actually move obviously to a notice to vacate if it gets to that. All right. And that's a really important part. Routines. Uh, why do we do routines, Phil? Uh, well, routine inspections, we want to make sure that the home is being, you know, well kept and, and looked after in orderly fashion on a regular basis. Um, I thought it was just because the BDM promised it. Yeah, when, when we listed, we told you we were going to do this, but I think it's a critical part for the, re, um, for the landlord relationship as well. Landlords want to know that, you know, I, I've signed you up to look after my property. I want to know on an ongoing basis that the home is being relatively well kept. You know? So I had a, a 19 year old that I was doing some work with up in Brisbane. And I said to her, Hey, you know, why do we do routines? And she actually said that because the BDM promised it. I said, okay. And if I go in to do a routine, teach me how to do it. She goes, well, I just look to see if the bed's made because if the bed's made, they're looking after the property. And I was like, wow, do you look at the gutters to see if there's grass growing in them? Do you look at the shower to see whether or not there's any, maybe for example, grout missing from the tiles, which could be a water leakage issue? Do you have a look at the ceilings and maybe for example, the, you know, the, 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 all the skirting boards and things to see if there's any evidence of, of water damage where there might be some preventative maintenance. So what I find that um, what really good businesses do is that maybe every six months, they might get like a, a building inspector or something to go to a subject property where we know there are a couple of issues. And ultimately the, uh, the team have to walk through and identify what the issues are quietly. They've got seven minutes to do it. And then the building inspector actually walks them through and says, hey guys, these are things that you could be aware of. Now we're not asking them to be building experts, but we do want them to say, hey, if there's a particular issue, let's make sure that we can identify it and go and have a conversation. So attention to detail, are the gardens being looked after, all of those things. Now, one of my guys, a guy by the name of Spencer Lawrence from Paramount in London, phenomenal operator in the property management and letting space. He says to me, Josh, do you know how we actually get more capital expenditure? At the routine, we do a video. So we walk through and we go, hey, by the way, here's the property, Phil, I've just identified this kitchen area. I think that we could repaint that. We could freshen it up. If we spent $1,000 to get that repainted, I think that we could probably get an extra $25 or $50 a week in rent. Would you be interested in doing that? And he said to me, Josh, Josh I've got a 95% success rate in the landlord approving capital expenditure because the video was shot at the routine. 
It's a very different way of actually thinking about it. Yeah, a couple of great little things that's got my mind ticking over. Also, just the additional education we could be doing inside our team. But that idea of, as I said, we're not expecting our property managers to be building experts, but mm. that continual just upskilling and understanding properties better. And as I said, more detail to things that really matter. And then obviously, you know, leveraging technology um, to... At the end of the day, Josh, helping our clients to get a better return. Mm-hmm. Like we start saying, yeah, like a little bit of work here, tidy up here, some paint in your kitchen bench top. You know, we're potentially going to get a better yield on that because I get you an extra, you know, fifty hundred dollars per week if we address these things. So, Phil, you know, classic. Um, when I was leasing this property in Balmain, you know, years ago, uh, I, I first of all I leased it through an agency, and then that agency then gave it to the landlord for landlord direct management, right? And I was, oh, okay. So all of a sudden, I, I get this phone call every year from my landlord at the name at the time, a lady by the name of Sandra. Oh, hello, Joshua, it's Sandra calling. I, I just thought I'd give you a quick call. You, you've been in the property for nine months already and, and Roger and I, we, we've loved having you at the home and we just want to ask you a very simple question. Would you like to stay on? Uh, yeah, Sandra, that'd be fine. Would another 12 months be good for you? Yeah, that would be great. Oh, it's lovely having you there. You're fantastic. Now, Joshua, obviously, you know, we've sat down and we've worked out the commercials and unfortunately, we are going to need to increase the rent by $20. And if you have a look at that, I know it's $1,000 a year and it sounds like it's a lot of money, but by the time you get a moving truck and move somewhere else and the disconnection, reconnection of services and the internet and how painful is that having to deal with Telstra and making all those things happen, it's probably going to cost you $2,500 a year to move, but yet if you stay in the property, it'll only cost you 1000 and you'll save over fifty. $1,500 by staying in the property. Would that be okay? Yeah, Sandra, that'd be fine. What a great sell. And so, and interesting enough, you know what ended up happening is that I go five years down the track of leasing that property. I'm like paying $620 a week or whatever. I move out when I bought my property and I moved into my, my house now in, in, in Balmain, you know, 10 years ago. An interesting conversation is, is that, you know, Sandra, when she took that thing back to market, she couldn't get more than $500 a week. Oh. <laughs> like she was a gun man about actually understanding how to do rent increases. But what have we done in the industry? Oh no, it's just automated SMS. Oh, it's an automated email. And we actually don't really think about what's the technique, what's the sales technique that comes in here to get a great rent increase. Because if we get a good rent increase, that means we increase the sellable value. What and, I love about that is she was saving you money. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know, like, right? Sandra really gave you the rub, you I know. know she, she, made, she made you feel good. You're like, oh, thanks, Sandra. You've actually done me a favour. Yeah. I'll pay you an extra $20 per week. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. And so then you start to think about, okay, we've got insurances, um, finance referrals are really big in the sector, you know, because obviously who's got the most debt? All of your landlords, you know, so how do we get a refi? And there's obviously lots of money that can be made out of mortgage referrals. Um, also, in addition to that, um, how many of our investors want to go and buy another one? So let's say, for example, we've got a thousand landlords. How many of those landlords have an appetite to buy another property? And what would that look like? So one of the things we're building out here is a weekly email that actually goes on. So how many um, for sale listings or auction listings do you have available at the moment in, in Harris Real Estate on your website? Roughly? Oh, probably a hundred, something like that. So yeah. you've got a hundred listings. Yeah. Okay. How many of those are currently leased? Uh, of auction properties. Or, or for sale, doesn't matter. How many of the properties that are available for sale right now are actually already leased, have a tenancy in place? Oh, it's maybe 20%, something like okay, that. Okay, so yeah. there's 20 right now. Yeah. And how many of the properties that you've got out of the other 80 would lease well, where it would make sense for an investor to buy that? Right now in Adelaide? Yeah. All of them. Okay, right. So but let, let's say there's 20. Yeah. Okay, great. Do you have an email that goes out to landlords that have opted in that says, hey guys, here's how many investment properties you could buy. These ones are already leased. These properties would lease well. And these properties would be really good for redevelopment because it's at the end of the useful life of the existing building or there's a change in density and requirements. And what I found is that you can't. So I'm an investor right now and I go to real estate agencies' websites and say, find me all the properties I've currently got a tenant in play. I can't find any. And so, right. and so, so naturally, you're not really thinking about that custom audience. So we've then got those basic ideas around what we do with maintenance and then capital expenditure items, which we've covered. Now, Phil, all of those areas of excellence, so knowledge test, equity, negative gearing, depreciation, capital expenditure, working out returns and pricing property, also flow over into the sales environment. But now let's go and talk about, for sales areas of excellence, you've got to be a gun at prospecting, true or not? Uh, I mean, prospecting is the absolute, you know, outside of listings, probably, you know, the most important skill that you need to have. I think ultimately one of the, the early mistakes people make coming to real estate thinking that, you know, I want to get in real estate because I think I'm going to be great at selling houses, whereas ultimately, Josh, your whole career is dependent on can you actually generate stock. If you can generate stock, then you'll have a phenomenal career in real estate. Listing? 
<laughs> without listing, you can't laugh, Josh. You know, <laughs> you know. But you know, he, here's the thing with listing, Josh. And oh, I talked to some of my team, and maybe a lot of the people listing is a lot of people out there, Josh. If they want to sell an extra ten houses this year, it may not actually be a prospecting issue. The issue might actually be they need to stop losing listings. Mm-hmm. So if you can take your strike rate from you know if you've got every ten presentations, if you're currently listing six out of ten, if we took that to a seven or eight out of a ten, like you actually don't have to make one more prospecting call. So a few hours, one on one with a coach or some role play or some additional training. Training could actually be an extra one or two hundred thousand dollars in revenue into your business just by not losing. I'll be controversial. I think you got to learn to list before you can prospect. Yeah, um, build I, your skills, build the questioning skills, learn the ultimate story of what we actually do for the client, and then go out there and start promising the clients that we can do that. Which is where the prospecting piece really comes in. Yeah, well, yeah, because otherwise you you are banging your head up against a wall because you know the you know most people are told when you start in real estate just go and make a hundred you know, cold calls and generate a lead. So you sit there for seven hours, you generate a hot list and you go out there, your listing presentation sucks and you lose it. Then bosses will go back and make another hundred calls, right? It doesn't make sense. And then negotiation, how do you do an auction? How do you do for sale? What does that look like? Then managing your team. Like um, apparently you can't just be moody around your team. There's a thing there, you got to manage up. You've got to be in a position that you're really clear about the functional roles. Hey, what do you do here? How do you work? Yeah, make sure you're getting reward and recognition. Um, it refreshes my memory. It might be good for you to talk them through this, Josh, but I remember going back years ago, you introduced me to the concept of level one, level two, level three yeah. agent. That was a real kind of turning point for me. These are the basic skills when you're getting set up as a solo operating agent, okay? Now we move into the level two space, which is maybe thinking about putting on support staff, and then we move into team. But yeah, maybe you're probably best to talk about that, Josh. I just think that like age old story, it's like, you know, um, you do you actually function around what we got to call the leader leader model or the leader follower model? And in leader leader, it's like, okay, great. So, Phil, what do you think we should do? In leader follower, oh, no, Phil, you need to do this. So, there's a big difference between telling people what to do and actually teaching people how to think so they can do it for themselves. Um, then there's all the other things auction, what you do with pre and post auction offers, how you handle a multi offer, what you do with a single offer, how you actually go and get a price reduction, how you go and upsell marketing, and actually knowing what those 11 different customer types are. So if we're walking to a listing preso right now of a divorce versus walking into a deceased estate versus walking into a job relocation versus walking to maybe into someone who's moving into a, a nursing home type situation, they're all very different approaches in empathy in how we're going to conduct ourselves inside of that listing presentation. Josh, question for you. If someone tuning in, right? So you just, you know, if you're a salesperson, you've just listened to what you've just spoken about there. There is a lot of skills and content that needs to be learned. Mm. What would be the learning plan that you would recommend? Where does somebody start? You've obviously got, you know, the baptism of fire. They can go and do the blueprint course with you and they get a really a great understanding to start with. But where do you think you start if you want to tackle this process? So I would work directly with my lead agent or my principal Mm -hmm. and I would say to them, hey guys, what are the next five key skills that's going to make me valuable? So let's just say Junior Josh comes and joins Phil Harris's personal sales team and I know nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what are the first five key skills? I need to teach them how to do an open house. I need to be able to teach them how to take an offer. I need to teach them how to be able to present that offer to the vendor. I need to teach them how to use the CRM and I need to teach them how to have really good market knowledge about what's been listed and sold. So we're just going to work on those first five key skills before we do anything else. Once I've achieved mastery in each of those skills, then we're going to go and bite off the next five key skills. But we're going to take an A4 piece of paper and every single time I master a skill, I'm going to write it on the page. We call it a circle of competence. So what actually happens over a period of time is that there's actually documented evidence of the new skills that I've now gained. And what actually that does, that fills up my cup of confidence so I can actually see that I'm getting progress inside of my career, but I'm actually really improving on those essential skills. Because the reality is, you know, those four or five competencies that you just spoke about, until you have the ability to actually conduct an open home, do a private show through, have some basic skills around negotiation, do open home callback, you pretty much have no value around that real estate office until you can actually function with some of those core skills. Yeah, and I think this is a really important conversation is that like, um, you know, and I, you know, you and I are both guilty of it, right? You move to that position of unconscious competence. You don't even know that you know how to do it, but you do it and like people don't even pick up on it. And then someone doesn't do it and you're like, well, why didn't you do that? And you didn't realize that like all the lessons that we've been taught over that period of time, you know, like if you're going to be running late to a meeting, communicate early, you know, have that conversation, make sure that you're right, like all that stuff. And you think that that's common sense, but it's actually not because common sense is not that common. And so what we've got to do is we've got to go and teach it. Um, Phil, our last principle, love this. Mastery is never ending, being an infinite learner. What are your thoughts about, you know, always being hungry to learn, being that infinite learner, not being too good to be in the room, you know, making sure you're a part of that culture, being somebody who actually really wants to become a master at what you do? Well, I think it's summarized. I think that the, the world that we're in now with, um, 
you know, innovation, whether it be various AI, whether it be industry disruption, whatever those things are, ultimately the only kind of immunity that you have for the ongoing success of yourself as an individual and the company that you represent is going to be that ability to learn and adapt. And so I think it goes back to what we've spoken about in previous episodes, Josh, that those that continue to succeed are those that continue to innovate and grow and learn and passion about self-improvement. If you can continue on that journey, as you said, be the humblest person in the room. There's nothing, there's never a person you can meet that you can't learn something from somebody, but it still staggers me, Josh. It seems as though uh, I still regularly attend conferences and seminars, seminars and webinars and all these sorts of things, but it does seem that people reach that stage in their career where they do plateau out uh, and the learning then doesn't become the priority uh, and then becomes stagnant in growth. So, yeah, great quote to, to wrap it up. And, yeah, at the end of the day, mastery is continue to learn to be passionate about that. You know, um, Phil, I got a lot of problems in my life. And um, so I went to Amazon.com. I started typing them in. And you wouldn't believe it. You know, like I thought that meetings suck. And there's actually a book called Meetings Suck by Cameron Herald. And I read it. Now I have the best meetings of my life. And so it's that whole idea that for 20 bucks, I get someone's entire life work around that particular issue and I can read it. And in under a few hours, I can actually have a completely different level of perspective, insight, knowledge that I can actually apply and put into my own world. And I can tell you that literally um, I'm not fed by what someone else gives me. I go out there and seek the things that I need to become a master at for the next stage of my journey and for my growth as a person. And, you know, we're all imperfect human beings search out the things that you need in order to be able to get better around what it is that you do and continually search for becoming that mastery of your craft. And I said this to someone recently the other day, not egotistically, but I wish that when I first started that I now have me now as a coach because what I've learned in the 20 years in this business is absolutely phenomenal and I could have got myself up out of the ground so much faster than I actually did when I first started out in residential real estate. So, you know, choose your own religion, but go all in on the training platform that you have chosen to become a true master of what it is that you do. Feeling good and ready for more? Thanks for joining us on Dream Big, Move Fast.